1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. I'm looking at verse 2. 1 Samuel 23. In verse 2 it says, Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines, and save Keilah. Let's pray. Father, I just ask that you take the distractions in our lives. Lord, all the circumstances and situations, Lord, that have our hearts just in turmoil and chaos. The things that we're struggling with right now this morning. The things that are going on in our world that, that cause us discomfort, Lord. That, that worry us. That beckon for our attention. Take those things this morning, Lord, and, and push them aside for for this, for this brief time as we seek to hear from you. Father, that your word would penetrate deep into our hearts and change us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You can all be seated. <clears throat> so as you all know, we're still moving our way through 1 Samuel. Now we're at chapter 23, verses 1 through 14. And if we had to give a title for the sermon this morning... It would be when men seek the Lord's will. The Christian really is so beautifully equipped for all that the Lord has sovereignly decreed in their lives. Whether they be in the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping, great tears, or Mount Zion, on the top of Mount Zion, joyfully singing praises, they are empowered from on high. If they are in battle, they're in the valley of humiliation by Apollyon or reaching out to the soul that's lost in the darkness of sin. They are well suited and armed for the Lord's work. In evil times and under the reins of evil, like we've been talking about in the last couple of sermons, men, uh, evil men, we see that every Christian has at their disposal the full armor of God. We see that in Ephesians chapter 6. We see where he talks about that belt of truth. And I don't know if you know much about armor and stuff like that. But that belt of truth is so very important. Because why? Well, it holds your britches up for one thing. And all the stuff that you have on here connects with the belt. And it keeps it all in place. And I can tell you it works. Because having that, that great big you know, 25, 30 pound belt in the sheriff's office around the way. It was connected to another belt, which is thus my, my, my bulletproof vest was tucked in with that. So I, it, it was all going right to the one spot right here. You can't get away from it. We, we see that after the belt of clue, uh, truth, we talk about the breastplate of righteousness, that thing that guards our hearts that, that is most, most important. We see the shoes of the gospel of peace. Wherever we go, that gospel of peace is going out before us. We see, we see the most important thing of the shield of faith. How are we going to stop the, the fiery darts of the enemy? We put that shield up and we block it. We see the helmet of salvation that protects that, that spot where our, where, our, where our brain is, where we think from. And then lastly, the sword of the Spirit that we wield so mightily. And add to those things praying at all times, keeping alert with all perseverance, and making supplication for the saints. And like I said, I can tell you from, from experience, it's good to have all that equipment on. Even though many times it's found to be very cumbersome when in the heat of battle. And if there was ever a time for the Christian to have on the full armor of God, it's today. And it's tomorrow. And it's every day until we go home to glory. We cannot afford to not have it on. The enemy, our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now even though we're so well equipped, that does not mean that we run off all willy-nilly not thinking about what we're doing in this world. We definitely don't want to do that in spiritual warfare, and spiritual battles that we're engaged in. As men and women of God, we are not called to be rash, to be reckless, to be overconfident in making decisions. It's, it, 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 is, it's, it is not often that we must make a split-second decision. We have time to step back and seek the Lord's will in everything that comes our way. 
How many times have you been burned by making a hasty decision? They're, they, they, they're, they are always, these hasty decisions, most of the time, will always bring sorrow and heartache. And let's pause for a moment and ask ourselves the question, at what point are we to seek the Lord's will in any given situation? At what point do we, do we stop going, wait a second, I need to seek what the Lord would have me to do in this. And yes, we are well equipped spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically for what the enemy may throw at us. We may have every bit of that and be ready to do anything. We're fired up with passion and zeal to serve the Lord. Even if that means storming the gates of hell, man, we're ready to go. We know we could. We know we would. But do we know if we should? Do we seek the Lord's will in all things? Even if it costs us dearly. Sinclair Ferguson says, should I or shouldn't I? Is often ultimately a question of obedience as well as knowledge and understanding. Very often when young people say they are having problems about guidance, what they are really faced with is a problem about obedience. The issue at stake is whether we will walk along the paths of righteousness in which God leads us. Are we willing to go through the valleys of deep darkness so long as he is with us? I'm convinced that if the believer would just pause and seek God's will in our lives, in the big things and in the little things, we would find far more victories in Christ. <coughs> what would our lives reflect? What would our lives look like if we sought the Lord's will before each word, each action, and each prayer? Today I want us to look at three things in our text. David seeks the Lord's will on behalf of his nation. David seeks the Lord's will on behalf of the nation. Then we'll see David seeks the Lord, the Lord's will on behalf of his men. And then lastly, David seeks the Lord's will in regards to his enemy. So as we start out, David seeks the Lord's will on behalf of his nation. Look at verses 1 and 2. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, and are robbing the threshing floor. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines, and save Keilah. Throughout our whole text, verses 1 through 14, we see David is constantly seeking the Lord's will in regards to his current circumstances. Now this isn't to say that he wasn't seeking the Lord's will before, because we see in chapter 22 and in verse 15, is today the first time that I have inquired of God for him? No, those are the words of Achimelech. So we know that David was a man who would seek the Lord's will in different circumstances and situations. So David had sought the Lord's will in his doings before, maybe in the battles or issues dealing with the kingdom's army. And this reminds us that David is God's man. David is the future king of the, of the nation of Israel. But this is the first time we see David seeking the, Lord, the Lord's will since he had to flee from the wrath of King Saul. And as we begin to look at verses 1 and 2, we, we have to remember that David is an Israelite of whom there is great character great integrity. He's of the tribe of Judah. And this is a man who will still seek to protect his nation and his kin. This will be his kingdom to rule one day. So he will be its guardian and its watchman, even still. Even though Saul has chased him away, he is still the watchman for the nation. And it matters not to David that Saul is still on the throne. David has a duty in his heart to defend the nation. Now, word has come to David's ear. The Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floor. Those to whom, to whom he had just recently sought refuge were now attacking his people. And David, again, he's going to defend the land 
and his kin with everything inside him. And Keilah was in the foothills of Judah, eight miles uh, northwest of, of Hebron. And it was a fortified city and was very close to the Philistine border. This could be a beautiful opportunity for David to rise up and show his tribe and to show the nation that he could deliver them. That he could rule them well. I mean, there's no sign of Saul coming to their aid at this point. Saul's, Saul's disappeared for, for some reason. The Philistines are, are fighting with the people of Keilah. And I can imagine this battle raging at the, at the gates and the walls of the city. And other Philistines are off in the fields. And they're stealing the grain from the threshing floors. This could mean starvation for those people. Or in the least, a great hardship for them. <coughs> Rise up, David. That's what we think. Rise up, David. Collect your men. Collect your weapons. And rush upon the Philistines' host and crush them. You've done it before. For God and for country, right? Yeah, let's go. And yes, it will expose you to Saul's wrath and persecution. But don't forget, the Lord's going to protect you. You're the, Lord's You're the Lord's anointed one for the kingdom. But wait a second. You notice something here? That's not what David does. David doesn't just rise up, grab the men, grab the weapons, and tear off for Keilah. He doesn't do what he could or what he would like to do at that point. He does what he should. He seeks the Lord's will in these circumstances. Now think about Saul. In chapter 12, he didn't consult the Lord at all. Chapter 13, he didn't consult the Lord at all. He started to consult the Lord in chapter 14, but then he abandoned it. He also cast lots, but failed to follow through with them to the Lord's will in chapter 14. Samuel came and counseled. Saul doesn't follow through in chapter 15. From 16 to 23, Saul still hasn't sought the Lord's will in anything that he's doing. Saul was an excellent Warning to David on what happens when one does not seek the Lord's will. Now I think two things are happening here. First, David is seeking the Lord's will first for himself. And I, th and I think that's appropriate. I think that's the right thing to do in, this, in these circumstances. It's always the right thing to do. He's seeking the Lord's will for him. Lord, what do I do? What do I do, Lord? What do you want me to do? do? Do I go or not go up to battle this pagan host? He's seeking the Lord's will was a personal thing for, for David. It's an issue for him alone. He wants to know for himself. He wanted to be faithful and obedient in all things. He sought to have a heart that was tender and still and quiet before the Lord so the Lord would lead him. Second, he seeks the Lord's will corporately for the nation. Listen, Lord, they are your people in, in Keilah. What do I do for them? What's my behavior to be towards them? How shall I lead them, Lord? What is your will for those people? What does the Lord's will include for those people in Keilah? And once again, he is truly trying to be sensitive to all that the Lord seeks to do through him for the nation. So let's apply it to our own lives. And, and here's the thing. I guarantee that probably every one of us in here will be very quick to say that anytime we find ourselves in a difficult set of circumstances, we seek the Lord's will. Is that a fair assumption for all of us? Oh yeah, when, when something bad happens, man, I go and I seek the Lord. Anytime there's a difficult decision to be made, we are going to the, to the Lord God on bended knees. Oh, we're so faithful to seek Him then, right? But what about the daily things of life? Do we truly think it is important to seek the Lord's will in our diet, in the books we read, in the movies we watch, in the clothes we wear, in the relationships that we build, in the hobbies that we have, in the vacations that we take, etc., etc., etc.? And I know that that might sound trivial, it may seem like it's going a little bit overboard, but shouldn't we at least consider asking the Lord when we make decisions in life? I think all these things are important enough to seek the Lord's will. Most importantly, 
Are we, are we obedient to follow his will for our lives when we have sought it and we know what it is? Even if we don't like it. <clears throat> I had a, and this is kind of what I mean, okay? Back a couple months ago, I received a job offer. I met with this guy, and guess what? He talked about it, and I love him. My wife, man, she's like she's like she's like a spear sometimes. This guy looks and he says, he says, are, are you are you ready to move up here? And my wife, what does she do? No. <laughs> I don't want to move up here. They asked me, say, well, pray about it. I said, okay. The Lord tell me no. He just kept telling me no. No. This no. It's not my will. No. That's why I'm still here today. Because I'm faithful to obey the Lord. And, and, and I don't know if I wanted it or not, but I knew that God was saying no. Right where I have is where I want you. Are we willing to do that even if we don't like it? If you take that good job offer are you, and you just take it before the Lord and He tells you no. No. Are you willing to say, okay, Lord, it's no, and move on? Young people. Uh, all I see is a bunch of girls. And I'm like, Joe's around here somewhere. Like, oh, listen, young people. Oh, there he is, right there. Right in front of listen, when that guy comes up and he's cute and he's got a great personality, will you take it before the Lord and let him tell you yes or no? That's an important life changing decision. And when he says no, will you go, ah, never mind, I'll go with him anyway. No! Follow the Lord's will in those things for your life. Listen, remember Saul? Remember a couple chapters back? To obey is better than sacrifice. He did not follow the Lord's will, and he knew it. It does absolutely no good to seek the Lord's will if you're not going to listen to it once you hear it. Now another thought, just as David sought for the will of the Lord for himself, he also sought corporately for the nation. And let's just ask ourselves, I mean, he was concerned about the nation. He was concerned about the people there in Keila. Uh, there we go. He was, a, he, he was concerned about those people. He was concerned about that city, that tribe, that nation. Do we as leadership, do we as the body of Christ seek the Lord's will in and for his church here right now? It can be easy for the church to get distracted and busy. And well, we just lose focus and we stop seeking his will and we do what we want. Or we just openly rebel and not listen to the direction he's pointing us to. And again, we're called to obedience when we know the Lord's will. Even if it puts us in difficult circumstances. I think we've made some of those decisions here in the last couple of years. It's been hard a couple of times, especially when attendance goes down to 17. To obey is better than sacrifice when it comes to the will of God. William Law said this, you are to think of yourself as only existing in this world to do God's will. To think that you are your own is absurd as to think you are self-created. It is an obvious first principle that you belong completely to God. If that's the case, then when we seek the Lord's will for ourselves, we're called to obedience. We're called to listen. And listen, we have such a beautiful, beautiful example of obedience to the Lord's will found in Jesus Christ himself. Look in Luke chapter 22, verse 42. What do we see there? Luke 22 and verse 42. It's just hours before the crucifixion. He's there at the Mount of Olives. All his men are getting ready to, to, to abandon him. Peter's going to betray him. It's fixing to get horrible. And he goes and he goes to the Father and he says, and he says, uh, and when he came and he withdrew about, from them about a stone's throw away, he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, there's that word willing, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We look out further. He was so seeking the will of his, his father, so in turmoil over what was about to happen. And it says that and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Even the Son of God sought only the Father's will. And that will took him to the cross. Jesus' act of obedience made him fulfill every point of the law for us. Jesus' passive obedience to his Father's will took him to the cross at Calvary. And oh, listen, the will of the Father should be a constant reminder for us to seek the Lord's will, to obey it, no matter what the cost is, both personally and corporately as the body of Christ. The next thing is this. David seeks the Lord's will on behalf of his men. Look there in verses 3 through 5. It says, actually 3 through 6. But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And David inquired of the Lord again. And the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah. For I will give the Philistines in your hands. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now we see that, that David not only seeks the Lord's uh, will for himself and on behalf of the nation, but now he's narrowed it down. He seeks the Lord on behalf of those who are with him in the forest of Erech. His men and his family are there with him. So the men are afraid to go. Even though David has inquired of the Lord, probably through the prophet Gad, and, and, and been, uh, been to, he's been given the go-ahead to go into battle, still the men are scared. Remember, those are outcasts, the less desirable. Those that are in distress and dead, bitter in soul and discontent, probably not the guys you would want going into battle with you against the Philistines. They're afraid. They're afraid of the Philistines. They're afraid of coming out of hiding because Saul is still lurking around somewhere out there in the shadows waiting to find them and kill all of them. Yeah, David, we think we should just stay right here for now. Uh, we love our country and all the people and we love Keilah, but it's pretty safe right here. So we're, go we're just going to stay right here. So what does David do? Absolutely, again... He seeks the Lord's will. I, I, don't, I don't think David is doubting the Lord here. He's doing this on behalf of his men. They need to know that God is speaking directly to them. They need to know God's will for them at that moment. So David goes and he asks again, Don't you want a man like that to lead you? God told him to go, but for the, for the tender heart of his men, he goes back again before the Lord. But the Lord does something a little different this time when, he, when David seeks him. We, we look at verse 4 and it tells him, it's, it says, it tells David, go and save Keilah. But now when we look down here, uh, well that was in verse 2, but now when we look at verse 4, now it's go and I will give the Philistines into your hand. Now they understand that there is an assurance, there is a promise of victory coming from the Lord. In regards to the circumstances. And what's the result? Verse 5. They struck them with a great blow. Not just a victory. But a great victory. Bring away the, li the livestock of the Philistines. That tells me that they probably chased them back into, into Philistine. And they saved Keilah. George Mueller. The, 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 they call him the rebel of Bristol. Said we are never losers. From doing the will of God. David wasn't going to be a loser here. Neither were, were his men. Because God, when, they, when he was sought out by David, David accomplished the will and there was victory. And look at what happens in verse 6. Right there, that's, that's, that's right there for all of us to see. Abiathar, the priest, he comes with the ephod, with the Urim and Thummim in his hands. 
David, I believe, is now being recognized as the true king of Israel. And I think this is all in response to David and his men's responding with obedience to seeking the Lord's will and then doing it. What a great comfort and a peace this must have been for David and the men to know that the high priest of the Lord brought down the ephod, the thing that leads and guides the kings, the thing that finds counsel out from the Lord, brings it to them. Now, practically speaking, what does this mean for you and I? Now, we've already addressed the points that, one, we must seek the Lord's will in all things, and two, we must obediently follow His will when we come to know it. So what now? What else is left? Well, I believe that we see persistence here. Persistence is seen in David as he has come, as he has gone persistently. And we think back to him like chapter 22 and verse 15, that is today the first time now. But David is persistently seeking the Lord's will. Are we that persistent in seeking his will in our lives? Will we be persistent to a fault? Will we be so persistent that some will find us an utter embarrassment? I want to be that kind of Christian. I want to be that kind of man. Always in front of my Heavenly Father, petitioning Him to know His will in all things. And oh, if we could be like that persistent widow that Jesus talks about in that parable in Luke chapter 18. Man, she just kept on coming before the king over and over and over, just bugging him. Finally says, give her what she wants. Get her out of my hair. I want to be like that when it comes to finding out God's will for me. We will be persistent in all sorts of things. I promise you this. And, and, and y'all are gonna, you're all going to snicker. But you will be, be persistent in all sorts of things. You'll be persistent in getting that discount in the store. I promise you. If you know there's a discount, discount you're going to get that discount one way or the other. You're going to be persistent on getting repairs done. On air conditioner for sure. <laughs> Ask my wife about that. Ask Rob back there about that. You'll be persistent about getting a meal. I get hangry. You know what I mean? I get hangry. That's the cross between hungry and angry. I'm going to be persistent until I eat. Some people are persi persistent about getting the house clean. Oh, you know all the things that you're persistent over. Sometimes we're more persistent in our sin and not repenting of it than seeking the Lord's will. But also see, David seeks the Lord's will for his men. For his, and, and this includes his family. His brothers are there with him. Do we do that? Do we seek the Lord's will for our family? Husbands, do you seek the Lord's will in regards to your wife and her needs? Fathers, do you persistently go before the Lord seeking His will for your children? Wives, are you persistent in seeking the Lord's will for your husband? Mothers, same thing. Are you persistent in seeking the Lord's will for your, for your, for your children? Children, you have a responsibility too. Are you persistent in seeking the Lord's will in regards to your parents? Grandparents, extended family, employers, all that, it all goes in there. Is not what Jesus did for us in the garden as he sought his Father's will? Were not we in view there as we were from eternity's past? Hebrews chapter 10 tells us something very interesting. Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 10. Through 12. Listen to, listen to what it says here. Hebrews 10, or 2, and verse 10 through 12. For it was fitting that he, Jesus, for whom by and whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. Jesus sought the Lord's will in regards to his brothers, you and brothers and sisters, you and I. 
And may we seek the Lord's will for our families. And may we do it persistently. Last point is this. David seeks the Lord's will in regards to his enemy. Now this section is a, is a little bit longer, but we'll make, it, we'll make a quick work of it. And l- let us look at verses 7 through 14. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. And Saul said, God has given, me into, given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. Then David said to the Lord, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as, a, as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained on the strongholds in the wilderness and in the hill country and the wilderness of Zip, and Saul saw him every day. But God did not give him into his hands. It doesn't take long in our story before Saul and his lunatic frenzy is back on task seeking to kill David. Saul finds out where David is and knowing the city is arrogant enough to assume that he now has the opportunity to finally kill David. Not only his, 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 his ungodliness, but his emptiness of anything spirit uh, of the Spirit of God inside him in verse 7 is what we see. He thinks, and I can't figure this out, I mean, you, we just can't wrap our brain around this, he thinks God is on his side. Now if, you, now, if you've read 1 Samuel up to here, how does he even remotely think that God is on his side, that God will honor him <clears throat> and give David over to him? He who had rejected God's will, rejected God himself, uh, God himself, rejected God's prophet, rejected God's word, he now seems to think that God will now somehow give over to him one more righteous than himself to murder him. He has truly lost his mind here. And just to note, even now, He does not stop to seek God's will in any of his actions. He summons the people up to war. But, listen, uh, David, David knew. Maybe maybe Gad or Abiathar knew and revealed it to him. Wait a second. Does David just get up and run? Does David get up and go fight him? No. David makes a decision to go seek the Lord. He doesn't doesn't make a decision based on his own thoughts, what he wants to do, or what he thinks is best. No, he calls for Abiathar and the ephod with the Urim and the Thummim in it. He's going to consult the Lord about his enemy, Saul. He wants to know from the living God what to do. And David asks for specifics. Will Saul come down? Then he asked, will the men of Keilah give me into their hands? And God responds, yes, he's going to come down. And yes, they will give you into his hands. David now knows the will of the Lord. And look at the first part of verse 13. <clears throat> first part of verse 13. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could, they could go. They depart Keilah and went somewhere, anywhere, anywhere but there to begin with. And in the process, he picks up 200 more men. Saul, when he sees his plans have been thwarted, he gives up the mission temporarily. David, what's he do? He thus retreats to the strongholds in the wilderness and the hill country and the wilderness of Ziph. Even though Saul continues to seek David, 
God makes sure that David is not found. God is going to make sure through his providence, his eternal plan for David, for Israel, for Saul, for you and I, and our ultimate salvation will come to pass. David sought the Lord's will about his enemy Saul and what he should do in regards to him. And God heard him and God answered him. <clears throat> now, now this gets tricky. So do we seek the Lord's will when it comes to our enemies? Do we seek the Lord's will when it comes to our enemies? Now first and foremost, I believe this is specifically about our enemies who are also the enemy of the living God. Satan, the imps of hell, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, those seen and unseen who hate us and want to see our final destruction because of our love for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes, and this might not sit right with some of y'all, I'm just going to say it like it is, Sometimes we are so busy as Christians screaming, my rights, my rights, my religious freedom, my rights for free speech, which is all good. It's all appropriate. But maybe his will sometimes is the purifying fire of persecution. Do we ever pray, Lord, your will be done, not mine? When it comes to persecution. What do we see in Acts? We don't see the apostles. We don't see the early church. And they're going. I deserve my religious freedoms. I deserve this. My freedom of worship. No. They're not doing that. They're subjecting themselves to the will of God. And that doesn't mean they were stupid. And careless. And, and harebrained. Or reckless. Or any of those things. They, they sought the Lord's will. What do we see in church history? What do we see in Fox's Book of Martyrs? And I'll say it again. You need to get Fox's Book of Martyrs, the unabridged edition, and you need to read it and understand your history, how your faith persisted and sought the will of God even in persecution. Men and women submitting to persecution from their enemies because it was the will of the Lord. What about the other enemies we have in this life? Those who just don't like us. Who have harmed us or wronged us in some way. Those who have been unfair, unjust. Those are just liars about you. Have we sought the Lord's will? And how to proceed from where we are now? But really, I think we already know what the Lord's will is concerning our enemies. I think it's a will that you already know too. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We know that the will of the Lord is concerning our enemies and what to do. And I hear many people would say, how, how do I do that? You don't know what I have gone through with some of these people. You don't understand the pain and the hurt. Yeah, I do. Maybe not the same circumstances or situations, but I know the pain and the hurt from enemies. And so does Jesus. 
We look at the apostles who abandoned him. Peter, who betrayed him. Judas, who betrayed him. We look at those who crucified him, and yet there from the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they did. And some will say, well, that was Jesus. Jesus, he's the, he's the Son of God. He can do that kind of thing, but I can't. Yes, you can. The Spirit of Christ resides in you. If you are a believer. Have you sought the Lord's will in regards to your enemies? But listen, make sure you do it with the right heart, with the right spirit, or there's not going to be any victory. Don't be like the one person whom C.S. Lewis talks about when he says this, there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, All right then, have it your own. Remember what Jesus taught his disciples about prayer. He said, Your will be done. Are we even praying and seeking to know the Lord's will in all things? In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, listen to what the writer says there. Hebrews 10 and verse 36. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Beautiful thing to be pointing out in these cases. Your will be done. I want to do His will out of obedience. You want to do His will out of obedience but also because we know that we will receive what is promised, eternal life with the creator of the universe in heaven. Is seeking the Lord's will important enough for you that you will do it? Dave Platt says this, So is this true in your life? Is your heart wholly and unhesitatingly surrendered to the will of God, no matter what it is? Are you underestimating God's care for you, as if he doesn't know what is best for you? Or are you overestimating your wisdom before God, as if you know better than what better than he does what is best for your life? We need to be seeking the will of the Lord, moment by moment in our day. And there may be some here who cannot seek the Lord's will in their life. Because they are far, far away from Him. You don't know His Son Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never just sat down and fallen to your knees and onto your face and surrendered your entire life to Christ. And to you I would say this morning, oh, run to Jesus. Please run now with every bit of strength you have inside you. Run to Christ. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Repent of your sins and believe the gospel. Christ died for sinners like you and I. And may the Holy Spirit move upon your heart and bring what is dead in you spiritually to everlasting life. And then seek the Lord's will in your life and all things to His glory. Remember, the Bible tells us for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, if you would just stop. Just stop living in the sin that you're living in. Repent and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God is raised from the, from the dead and you will be saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Seek the Lord's will today. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would move in our hearts and draw us close to you. Don't let anybody leave this morning.